The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Hand on some of the technical details, and if you go over my head, I'll let you know, and I'll refer you to other things. So we're going to be uh, looking at more uh, from the usability point of view. And is it going to move along? Hang on here. That's where I want to be. So we're going to discuss uh, ZFS features. Uh, being a BSD person, I'm going to concentrate on some of the uh, uh, FreeBSD tools. So we're going to look at uh, how they are integrated into a network attached storage. So a lot of people are familiar with FreeNAS, which is based on FreeBSD. This talk is looking at version 9215, which is the current release, but we are in RC1 for 9216. So I'd expect that one to be out in another week or so. PCBSD allows you to build uh, typically a desktop on top of FreeBSD, makes it easy to use. 10.02 is what I'll be showing off because we've added a lot of new functionality. That has actually been built and it's going to be announced on Monday. So that will be our latest release. Um, both uh, myself and Ken at the FreeBSD booth are running that version of PCBSD. So if you see anything in this talk that interests you, feel free to come by the booth and you can play with it yourself. You could actually look at the tools. So those will be the OS's we're concentrating on. Mm -hmm. So for those who aren't familiar with what ZFS is, it is a file system. It was designed um, 12 years ago now. And the original designers of ZFS wanted to create a file system that would scale with modern hardware. And they were actually thinking towards the future so in their original design, the hardware they were building for did not exist yet. Fortunately, hardware has moved on in the last 12 years. And we're all familiar with Moore's Law and just the pace of which uh, drive capacity, memory capacity is increasing. And we don't see that stopping anytime soon. So most of the Unix file systems uh, that are in existence today are still dragging along design ideas from the 70s and the 80s when RAM was at a premium and you couldn't even dream of disk sizes that we put on our, our personal laptops these days. So this one is designed to be scalable. It's 128 bits, so it's going to be a long time before we can run out of disk space. One of the more interesting features about ZFS from a file system point of view is that it's copy on write. And the easiest way to describe copy on write is as the file system writes data to disk blocks, it never overwrites the contents of an existing disk block. So if you edit a file and it's saving your changes to disk, it's not going to touch the original file data. It's going to write that data elsewhere on disk. And that sounds a bit weird, but as we go through this presentation, you'll see what benefits that gives you. So copy and write, most people think, are the future of file systems, and we're starting to get some copy and write file systems. The other thing is if you've been around Unix-like operating systems for a while, it takes um, a bit of a brain shift to figure out how to set up your disk for ZFS. So if you've set up Unix before, you know that ahead of time you have to think how big should root be? How, what about USR? What about VAR? Because these are things that you have to uh, uh, format. You have to give the sizes uh, when you format the file system. And basically that's your limit. With ZFS, you don't do that. Uh, ZFS, you feed it disks, and then as you want to divide up your data, you create file systems as you need to. The cool thing about creating uh, file systems with ZFS is unless you set a quota on a file system to restrict its size, 
it has the full um, capacity of the pool. So if you create a 80 terabyte pool and you create a file system on it, every file system has access to that entire pool. So it's a very different way of looking at how to set up your storage. So when you're creating this concept known as a pool, think of it as the root of your file system. And what you do is you add disk to it. Now, if you are thinking of very large storage capacity, and you have very large disks and a lot of them, you don't want to throw them all in at once. So uh, it supports something known as virtual devices or VDEVs, where you feed it a certain number of disks at a time. As you feed those disks, you can decide, am I going to have redundancy? Is that something that's important to me? And if I have redundancy, we want to keep in mind that as I replace failed disks, I have to recreate um, that uh, virtual device. So I wouldn't throw 30 um, 10 terabyte drives into a VDEV. That's going to take a long time to recreate that if I have to put in a different disk. And in ZFS, recreating uh, your redundancy is called uh, silvering or resilvering. So that's one of the things you want to keep in mind as you're feeding disks to ZFS. The nice thing about ZFS, though, is it's designed to scale for your future needs. So as you are starting to run out of disk space, you just throw in additional uh, virtual devices. And then you've increased the capacity of your pool. When it comes to redundancy, uh, ZFS, one of its design goals was to overcome some of the limitations built into hardware RAID. Anyone who's used hardware RAID before knows that it's possible for the controller to not tell you right away if a disk is starting to die and that you can actually be writing corrupt data over time uh, before uh, the controller eventually clues in and tells you. ZFS was designed that as it writes your disk data blocks, it puts checksums in every block. And every time it reads a disk data block, it checks that checksum. And it's going to let you know if it's finding checksums that don't match. And oftentimes, that's an early indication you have a bad part of a disk. So it's designed that you don't have to purchase RAID controllers. You can still use it with a RAID controller, but we recommend uh, that typically you're putting that controller in JBOD mode so that ZFS has direct access to your disks. Um, yes. Sorry about that. I have problems with these slides here. So that when um, ZFS is actually um, doing redundancy on your disks, that's known as a RAID Z. There's currently three levels of RAID Z, where the number after the Z tells you how many disks you can lose per VDEV before you lose data. And this is another reason why you want to decide how many disks at a time to put in a VDEV. So if I have 15 disks and I want to create a RAID Z1, where I can lose one disk per VDEV, I could, for example, have three VDEVs of five disks each. So that way, if I'm resilvering, only per group of five uh, am I having to recreate that. The other thing that uh, ZFS does differently when it's doing its RAID, um, in conventional hardware RAID, depending upon the type of RAID is where your parity data is written, ZFS always distributes parity blocks across all disks. So that way, you don't have any single points of failure for your parity. Depending upon how important your data is, so this is something we see more in FreeNAS land for people who are um, concerned about storage and large capacities. If it's going to be a bad thing for you, if two disks fail at a time, uh, don't do a RAID Z1. I'll move up to the next level of RAID, which is RAID Z2. So again, very similar. Your parity is across all disks, and you can lose up to two disks. Right now, the most redundancy that's available is RAID Z3. So you can lose up to three disks per VDEV um, before you lose any data. So that's an overview of the file system itself. 
If we take a look at the tools that we have to manage this, I'm going to show it for both FreeNAS and PCBSD. So in FreeNAS, your operating system is separate from your storage disk. So you install FreeNAS either on a USB thumb drive or an SSD. So creating your pool is something you do uh, post-install. So here I have the web interface for FreeNAS. I don't know how well you can see this, but we have a section called Volumes. And I can add a volume, get into the ZFS Volume Manager. I have to give the volume a name. I can optionally um, encrypt the disks in case I'm worried about somebody uh, physically walking off with my disks. And then it will tell me how many disks I have available, and I simply select how many disks I want to put into a VDEV. In this example, I only had five, so I have one left. I've already selected four. If this was like a 30 disk block, I could go at the same time uh, create all of my VDEVs at once, how many that I wanted to create. It reminds me that I'm actually formatting these disks. I'm going to lose the data if there's anything already on them. So fairly uh, easy to use. In PCBSD, because PCBSD, you're either installing a desktop or a server. Uh, it's during the actual installation that you're going to set up your disks. So in the installer, it just tells you if you just have one disk, uh, just press next and keep on installing. Otherwise, if you do have multiple disks, you can decide to create mirrors or one of the RAID Zs. One of the things I haven't mentioned yet, uh, ZFS with mirrors is different than traditional hardware RAID mirroring in that you can use any amount of disks in a mirror. So it's not just two disks or four disks. If I check this box, I then just say if I wanted, to, uh, I select my mirror or my type of RAID Z, and I check off the disks that I want to put in there. We have a couple of other terms that I want to go through, and then we'll start looking at some of the, the cool features and what we can do with them. Uh, one of the terms you see with ZFS is something called the ZIL, or the ZFS Intent Log. Think of this as um, where your writes go until they actually get written to disk. We all know that it's always faster to get things out of memory than it is to disk. So if you have a lot of writes, you may actually benefit from having a secondary ZIL or a secondary log. The thing that you have to understand, though, is you have to know the type of writes that you're doing on the system because this only affects synchronous writes. It's not going to help you at all if your utilities are doing async writes. And typically, this is something we see more in FreeNAS, because you have a lot of people coming over the network uh, doing writes. So in FreeNAS, we actually have a utility called ZillStat, which will monitor um, how often your Zill is getting hit. And it gives you an idea of whether you would actually benefit uh, from having a secondary log device. The other term that uh, uh, people think about is their ARC and their layer 2 ARC. So if your ZIL is your read cache, uh, your ARC or your write cache, ARC is your read cache. Again, this is in memory. Um, it's going to take time as a system boots up and the data starts uh, to be read. Uh, for your ARC to populate. And basically, you want your most read data to be stored in RAM, so it's there for quick access. If you have a lot of uh, misses in your ARC cache, a miss means it had to actually go to disk to get the data, you may actually uh, benefit from increasing your ARC. And again, we give you utilities to actually monitor um, for what's happening in your ARC cache. So uh, FreeBSD itself, its top utility includes ARC stats. So you can just run top. And in FreeNAS, we've added a couple of Python utilities uh, that'll give you a summary or show you a running status of your ARC. Uh, let it go live. For both uh, secondary log and a layer two ARC, uh, we recommend that if you're going to add one, use a fast device such as an SSD. Because if you really, you're trying to increase performance uh, if you're adding these devices. 
It's very easy to add these in both FreeNAS and uh, PCBSD. So here I'm in Volume Manager again. I could actually add either of those devices uh, when I first set up the pool, but often this is something that's done afterwards when I'm trying to fine tune the performance of a system. So I can just go in again, say I'm in volume one, that's the name of my pool. Uh, it'll show me what devices I have and I can just add a log or a cache device and it will start using it right away. PCBSD, there's a couple of places you can do this. This screen here is new in 10.02 because we've had uh, especially um, server users ask us for it. So uh, you'll see it in the 10.02 installer. And right during install, uh, this one I didn't have any SSDs on the system, but if I did, they would show up here and I just check the box to either create a cache device or a log device. Post install, we have a utility in PCBSD called the Disk Manager. So I just pick the ZFS Pools tab, I highlight the name of my pool, and I can add a cache device or I can add a log device. Now we get into some of the interesting stuff. So that's basically our terminology for ZFS. So I mentioned before that you create your pool and then you create file systems as you need them. Typically those file systems are called data sets. And again, it takes a while to understand why would I want to make different data sets or different file systems? Why not just have my great big pool? And the answer to that really depends upon what you're doing with your storage. So if this is a, um, a server system, do you have a lot of users? If so, it makes sense to give each user their home directory as a separate uh, data set. And this makes things uh, easier for a lot of reasons. One is you can set permissions on data sets. You can set various properties, so you can set things such as quotas, so you could give each user uh, their own quota for a data set. So data sets are in some way, they're like folders, because you can set permissions and properties, but they really are file systems. Users is one example. Another example may be for different types of data. So if you're storing a lot of, uh, say, ISOs or virtual machines, you may want to put that type of data on a different data set. If you have um, a lot of uh, media uh, that would, for example, benefit for compression, store in its own data set and set the compression property on it. So you have a lot of flexibility of what you're going to do with your data. There's literally dozens of configurable properties. All of them are listed in detail in MAN ZFS. And FreeBSD has all of their MAN pages online. So you can just do a search for MAN ZFS. I've mentioned some of the most commonly used uh, properties, but there, there are literally dozens of properties. In FreeNAS, to make a data set, I select my volume, and surprisingly, it says <coughs> add data set. The only thing I have to give a data set is a name, but I can set some of the most common properties while I'm there. So for example, I can set compression, I can set a size on the data set, and there is an advanced mode if I want to see more properties. In PCBSD, I can do this both during installation and afterwards. Here I have the default screen on the installer, and you'll notice by default, PCBSD creates a whole bunch of data sets for you, and those data sets are actually used by the utilities and I'm going to describe some of those. So for example, there's a data set for where your software is installed, there's a data set for where home directories are installed, and as you create users, each user by default gets their own data set. But you can go in and add data sets as you want to, and you can set uh, any of the properties on them. Post install, I can go back to Disk Manager and I can just say I'm really creating file systems, so they call that tab the File System tab. I click on Add Data Set and I can set a bunch of properties. 
and basically give the data set a name and set properties on it. Another type of file system is called a Zval, and this is basically to an end user or an application. It's a raw block device. So you these, when you create a Zval, you have to set a size on it. And the most common use for Zvals is iSCSI. So you're using it as a device extent. So when an iSCSI client uh, connects, uh, for example, to a FreeNAS system, it just sees a disk that's ready to be formatted. The cool thing with this is if you have clients that need to use other file systems or other operating systems, to them it's just a disk, they format it, they do whatever they want with it. But underneath all of that, uh, that data is being protected by ZFS. So it's still checksumming as it's writing all the disk blocks. It's still alerting a view of what's happening on that area of disk. To create a ZVOL on FreeNAS, I again go back to my pool. It uh, calls create a ZVOL. I have to give it a name and I have to set a size. And then I can just uh, click and create it. Uh, we do support both thick and thin provisioning and you can set compression on a ZVOL. Now we start getting into the cool stuff. And probably the coolest thing about ZFS is it's uh, the way that it does snapshots. So file system snapshots have been around for a while, but typically a traditional file system snapshot, if I have a partition that's 60 gigs in size, if I create a snapshot, I'm gonna end up with a 60 gig in size snapshot. So it's basically recreating uh, that partition. So it takes, um, in the background, it takes a while to create the snapshot and it takes a while to deal with the snapshot. A lot of file systems also set limits on how many snapshots you can create and how many it can store. ZFS does snapshots differently. When you create a snapshot, it literally takes a couple of milliseconds and that snapshot is originally zero bytes in size. So one way of thinking about what is a ZFS snapshot to the file system is just a demarker for a point in time. On your local pool, your snapshots will start to grow as you move away from that point in time and you start making changes to files. So that's when your snapshots start to grow. Snapshots can be recursive, so that means if you have um, a root file system and you've made um, uh, ch children file systems underneath it, it atomically creates them all at the same time. So you're not gonna have any problems with the data that's stored in the disk. I had a question last week about this because we're gonna be talking about replication. Well, if the snapshots are zero bytes in size, how can I actually recreate the data? On the local system, ZFS already has everything that it needs. I can go and replicate those snapshots to another system. And the first time I replicate, um, it's going to take a while to recreate the pool on the other system. And then as I um, replicate snapshots, those are going to be very quick going over to wire. So it's almost like an R-sync, because it's only going to send over the stuff that has changed. Um, but it's using a, a ZFS send and receive to do that. So it, it always seems weird, well, but zero bytes in size, how can I recreate my data? And I'm, we're gonna show a bit about recreation of data. So creating a snapshot is very easy. So uh, in FreeNAS, um, basically, it's just a scheduler. How often do you want your snapshots to occur? And they'll automatically happen behind the scenes. Uh, because FreeNAS is used a lot in enterprise environments, you can set the day of your, the week, and you can also set the hour. So for example, you could do it between nine and five, Monday to Friday, and that's when it would create snapshots. Um, PCBSD. There's a couple of places that we can create snapshots. And one of the things that's interesting, especially from a server point of view, 
So FreeBSD for the last 12 years has had a virtualization technology called Jails, uh, which is very similar to what Linux is starting to do with containers. So Jails are basically a separate FreeBSD operating system, so it allows you to deploy uh, on one system other instances of FreeBSD. The difference between usual virtualization methods is that it's very lightweight. So for example, on my laptop, I could easily run hundreds of jails where each jail was its own web server, MySQL database, whatever. If I try to run more than two instances of VirtualBox on my laptop, things start to slow down. So PCBSD, because they're trying to make things easy graphically for management, we have a utility, surprise, surprise, called Warden. It's used to manage your jails. So you can go in and create jails. In this example, I happen to have three jails running. And I've gone into the snapshots tab. And for each jail, uh, this one, I have this one highlighted, I can set a snapshot schedule. And that can be different for each jail on the system. So it makes it very easy um, to, to back up and replicate what's happening in each jail. So that's one place we can automate snapshots in PCBSD. If I'm worried about the host system itself, whether it's a desktop or a server, our backup utility is called Life Preserver, and it uses ZFS uh, snapshots exclusively. So the first time you run Life Preserver, it's going to ask you to set up your snapshot schedule. Uh, and you can um, say how often you want to do that. The default is actually automatic. And what it will do is every five minutes, it'll create a snapshot. And then it'll do it every hour, and then every day, and then every month. So it actually has its own uh, preservation schedule. You can also set up pruning, so you can say how many snapshots you want to keep or for how many days you want to keep your snapshots. Typically when you're creating snapshots, um, there's a couple of benefits that you get. So on the local system, you're going to have the ability to restore things. And if I replicate my snapshots elsewhere, I can actually recreate that system if it blows up or someone steals it or God knows what can happen to systems. So if we take a look at restoring data from snapshots, so Life Preserver itself has a file manager built into it. And I'm going to sh show you that on this system. And it allows you to easily go through. So if I'm taking snapshots every five minutes, I can scroll back in five minute intervals, find a file that I know I've modified, and restore that file. And I'll show you how we do that. If I have another uh, system available in my network that is running ZFS, so possibly a FreeNAS system or another um, FreeBSD system, I can replicate those snapshots there. And if my local system uh, somehow becomes unusable, I can start the installer, go look for my backup server, and say, I would like to rebuild this system from last Tuesday at 1.30. And we can do that. I'm going to show you um, some of these. So this one I'm going to show what's actually happening on my system, because it's more exciting than a screenshot. So this one is live. I apologize that the font is small, so you can only see so far. So this system here, I'm running the automatic schedule. So every five minutes, it's taking a snapshot. Now, snapshots, think of them as what's changed in the last five minutes. So if nothing has changed, there's no snapshot to take. So it's only as I'm editing files on my system. Up here, let's see, because I can't see what I'm doing here. So let's see how good I am. By default, it shows the user's home directory, but I can go into Etsy. So if I've changed a configuration file and I don't like my changes, I can go back in time. But if I stick in my home directory, let's see here. So we have a couple of ways of looking through snapshots. So each snapshot in its name will have a timestamp. And I can go back 
These are typically five minute increments. And I can see what's changed on my system. If that's too slow for me, I can also slide. So this system here, um, earlier this week, I made a manual snapshot, which I can do at any point in time. And I had a whole bunch of stuff. And then I said, well, let's clean up some of this stuff. I don't need it anymore. So you'll notice the next snapshot that was taken, there's a little bit less stuff there. And as I've gone through the week adding stuff, removing stuff, my snapshots have changed. If I wanted to go back to this point in time and say, oops, I wish I hadn't um, gotten rid of that ISO file, uh, all I have to do is highlight it and click Restore. This one still exists, so it's not going to overwrite the current copy. Instead, it's going to say reversion. And so I know that this is a reverted copy. If I decided, OK, oh, it's going to let me close that. Oh, it's waiting because it's a large file. OK. Uh, I'll wait a bit longer. I kept trying to close it. I guess I should have picked a smaller file. But if I went to a snapshot two days later and wanted to restore that same file, it would call it reversion two. And then I could do a reversion three or reversion four. So I can get um, what files look at at a point in time. So right now it's boring because I'm doing a four gig file and that was silly of me. But uh, I just wanted to give you an idea of how easy it is to actually do that. And is it gonna let me move this out of the way? Let's just throw you down there. So that's built right into your desktop. So it's very easy uh, to be able to do that. The other screen that I want to show you is if I've replicated. Uh, let's see if I can get this guy back again on this screen. If I've been replicating my snapshots to another system, so that's just our browser. And um, I find out that the TSA stole my laptop or whatever. <laughs> I get home. It doesn't have to be the same hardware, so I could go home and say, I need to restore my system. So I just start the installer again. I say restore from Life Preserver Backup. I get my mouse back here. Well, there it is. It'll start a wizard, and it will ask me uh, what's the IP address of the system holding your snapshots. It'll ask for my username and password. And it will give me a drop down menu of all of my snapshots. And I can say, let's restore that system to what this system looked like Tuesday at 1.30. And it will do that. Anybody think that's cool? Right. A couple of other uh, benefits we get with ZFS. So again, another one of its design goals was let's create a syst uh, file system that's self-healing. And part of that self-healing is those creation of checksums. So every time it writes a data block, it makes a checksum. Every time it reads a data block, it double checks and verifies that checksum. If it's reading a data block and the checksum doesn't match, it will go out looking to see if there is another data block with the same checksum. And if it is, it will try to uh, correct the data in the incorrect uh, disk block. So this happens all the time as you're using ZFS, as you're editing your files. One of the things that you also want to do is schedule something known as a scrub. So depending upon how you're using your data, it's quite possible you'll have files in your system that you just never read, or maybe you read them once or twice a year. What a scrub does is it systematically goes through every single disk block that's used, checks the checksums, keeps track of how many bad checksums it finds, and tries to correct the ones that it can. And this is something, it is uh, disk I.O. intensive, so don't do it at Monday at 9 o'clock in the morning when everyone's logging in. Uh, schedule it for a time when the system's not busy. And there's no sense doing scrubs if you're not going to read the status report at the end of the scrub, because you really do want to see, did you find any bad disk blocks? Did you have anything that you weren't able to correct? So this will often be an early indication of problematic disks. And then you can make plans what you're going to do from there. 
So on a Freenas system, as soon as you make a pool, it automatically schedules a scrub for you. And that scrub is scheduled for every Sunday at midnight. If that's not a good time for the use of your system, you can go in and change that. Uh, Freenas, uh, because it's a storage device, you really do care what's happening with your disks. We're gonna email you if there's a problem. Uh, we're gonna have a nice um, uh, feedback in volume status, and you can type Z pool status as well to see what's happening. And PCBSD, we can use Life Preserver or Disk Manager uh, to manage our scrubs. So again, in Freenas, uh, basically if you don't like the scrub schedule, uh, just open it up and set the day of the week and the time you'd like to run it. PCBSD, if I'm in Life Preserver, I just go to my disk tab and start the scrub. Life Preserver itself always has a status, which is green, yellow, or red, and it's gonna alert you if you had a bad scrub, if you had a bad replication, that sort of thing. And let's see what we got here. This is uh, an interesting uh, feature uh, that comes with ZFS and it was one of the things uh, that when it first came out, people were waiting for. And it was one of the things that people very quickly found out that they really didn't want. So deduplication in theory is a great idea. So the, the process of deduplication makes sure that you never have duplicate data blocks. So it will only write the data once. I actually asked the guy who wrote deduplication, why did you write it? Because they don't like deduplication themselves. And they said, Sun's marketing department said it was a feature we had to have. And that's why they wrote deduplication. So what the whole goal of deduplication is to save disk space. And what we've found, especially since we now have better ZFS compression algorithms, is typically you'll get as good disk, a disk space using compression as using deduplication. And it's not gonna give you the overhead. So the real problem with deduplication is it needs to uh, keep tables to keep track of what's the contents of each disk block. And those tables have to fit into memory. And really bad things happen if you run out of memory when you're using deduplication. So typically we say, unless you have a lot of memory and you can never have enough memory, especially if you're usually using it for something else, try compression. You'll probably uh, get the goal that you want to do. For those that really want to try it and have lots of memory, the general rule of thumb is don't attempt it unless you have at least five gigs of memory per terabyte of storage. So very heavy memory requirements. Anybody here come from the Solaris background? You Solaris? Oh, then, then you, guys, you guys don't know about boot environments then. So boot environments right now are the coolest thing. So out, of all, out of all the cool features I've told you about ZFS, boot environments is the coolest. So the concept of a boot environment is that changing things on your system should always be a no risk operation. You should always be able to recover from any type of failure. So in a boot environment, um, this is something that is new for 10.02. We've had them before, but you had to remember to make them. Um, now we actually do it for you automatically. So before you apply a system patch, so there's a new security advisory out, you need to patch something. Before you upgrade the operating system, before you upgrade any software, PCBSD will automatically take a snapshot of your operating system and add it to the Grub Boot Manager. If something goes wrong, all you have to do is reboot and pick the point of time before you did that upgrade, and you'll be back exactly to where you started. So that's something that happens automatically. Boot environments are also handy for a lot of other things. So a lot of uh, developers who are in development environments, maybe you want to have different um, <coughs> versions of the operating system as you're developing your tools. So before you start making changes, create a boot environment, 
If you didn't like what you did, just go back uh, to the previous one. There are no limitations on how many boot environments you can have. Uh, you can make as many as you want. What PCBSD is doing, um, especially when it comes to patching the system, often when there's a uh, security patch available, they come two or three at a time, and it will actually do a separate boot environment for each patch. So for example, a couple of weeks ago when Heartbleed was out, uh, that would be a separate boot environment than say a different um, system patch. So if there's only one patch that did harm to your system, you can just basically revert that. For the automated boot environments, um, there is an, also an automatic pruning schedule. So by default, it will keep your last five but you can change that to how many you want to show in your Grub Boot Manager, because nobody wants to go through 120 entries in Grub to find the, the particular boot environment you want. So we'll prune uh, for you. So if you're going to manually take a boot environment, we have a tool which is surprisingly called Boot Manager. Uh, it, the system always comes with the default boot environment, uh, which is the operating system as it is now. If I want to create one, I just click Add, I give it a name, and it instantaneous, instantaneously creates one. Because it's a snapshot, it takes milliseconds to create it, and it's zero bytes in size. In this example, I manually created one, which I called before upgrade. I don't have to remember to do that anymore, because 1002 now would do that for me. So that's one of the really slick features uh, that which I find in this release uh, one of the exciting features. And I think that's all I had for the slides. So I have a bunch of additional resources. Um, both PCBSD and FreeNAS have very comprehensive user guides. Um, PCBSD, it's an icon right on your desktop because we do release um, our guides with our software. Uh, FreeNAS, it's in the download link for the software, uh, the version for that version. Uh, the ZFS Best Practices Guide is a good overview of how ZFS works. And for those of you um, who prefer to watch videos, uh, Becoming a ZFS Ninja is a good one. And again, I'll put it on the uh, last slide, which has the link to last week's presentation as well as this one, so SELF for this one and also my contact info. Uh, did we have any questions? Yes. So, yes. So, in FreeNAS, that's a very popular use for the storage device. So, which, um, using VMware? using KVM. I know we do have people who use KVM that are using FreeNAS. So I don't know if they're doing this over iSCSI or, or how they're doing it though. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that a uh, snapshot doesn't really have a size until it grows with time. Correct. Um, when you have a lot of snapshots, does only the last one grow? No, so you're growing per increments of time. So one of the things you have to be careful with, um, especially when you're designing your system, is ZFS doesn't like to run out of disk space. So the rule of thumb is never go over 80%. So as you need to, just add more disk to your pool, which is a very easy thing to do. With snapshots, um, it really depends upon how often files change on your system. So, um, one of the things that's interesting about ZFS is if you're running out of disk space, remember to turn off your snapshots before you start deleting data, because you don't ever really delete data. Otherwise, you're just increasing with more snapshots. Um, but the overhead, typically the overhead that people see is when they try to replicate. And this is something that's going, uh, that a feature that a lot of people can't wait to come out, and it's supposed to come out later this year. That first replication can be a real pain, especially if you have problems on your network. 
because you don't want, that one is going to be big because it's basically setting your whole pool over so the other side can start knowing where your points in time are. And if that gets interrupted during, um, if replication gets interrupted, what currently happens now is the two sides are in sync and you can't resume uh, where it dropped off. So what people are waiting for is resumable ZFS send and we're supposed to be getting that at the end of the year. But typically after that, especially, we actually recommend that people take snapshots often, especially if you're replicating, because it's less data that you have to send over at a time. But if you do run low on disk space, turn off snapshotting before you try to delete stuff. That's where a lot of people get confused. It says I'm actually increasing in disk space rather than, rather than decreasing. Yeah. Yep. So that's interesting. So one of the things that happened was when Oracle bought Sun, it was a, at an unfortunate time for the open source community because uh, Sun was working on encryption for ZFS and it hadn't been open sourced yet. So the only people in the world that had encryption built into ZFS is Oracle. And we all know Oracle's not gonna open source that and Oracle is gonna hold that as a feature. So for the first couple of years after the acquisition, people were thinking, well, A, we shouldn't hold our breath. We're not going to get anything out of Oracle. But what are we going to do now? So what um, both FreeNAS and PCBSD do is um, um, use something called Jelly, which is built into FreeBSD. Um, I actually had a question last week where somebody asked about how cryptographically secure Jelly is. So Jelly is spelled G-E-L-I, and if you do a man Jelly, it actually describes the whole crypto thing because it has undergone crypto analysis. So if you're in a secure environment where that counts, you can actually read up on that. So Jelly encryption is good for a specific purpose. So with Jelly encryption, all of your disks have to be encrypted, and the only thing it protects you from is someone stealing your box because anything that's Jelly encrypted, as it starts to boot, it stops as the kernel is loading, and unless you know the passphrase, it's not gonna load your kernel. So it's really good if someone steals your disk. It's, it's, they're never gonna get into them. What it's not good for is once you enter your passphrase, you're no longer encrypted until you shut down the system. PCBSD offers a second level of encryption because you're starting to get into the desktop and the server space. So in addition to Jelly, we have something called PEFS, the Personal Encryption File System. That one, you have to actually search for PEFS and FreeBSD because uh, FreeBSD hasn't imported it yet because it's still waiting for its cryptographic analysis. So FreeBSD tends to be really anal when it comes to cryptography. But PCBSD, we're using it as early adopters. And this one is cool from a user perspective. So it doesn't matter if the disks are encrypted or not. You can or cannot use Jelly. But what happens is when you boot into a system running PEFs, it's on a per user basis. So it's actually the user's home directory. And if one of the users on a PCBSD system checked off the little box that said, I want paths, if anybody does an LS of their home directory, all they see is gobbledygook. And that's really cool. Now, what you have to be careful of is if I'm logged in. So when I go to log in, if I'm using paths, it's going to ask me for my passphrase, so it can unencrypt. If somebody, if I go to the bathroom and somebody sits down while I'm logged in, they see all my data. So you have to remember to log in, log out. But uh, as far as reading the contents of a hard drive, if the person's not logged in, they're not going to see anything. So we get both. Yes? I had a question actually with uh, the snapshots. So basically, say you've got a bunch of files, and yep. you take a snapshot, and then you delete a file, mm -hmm. and you take another snapshot, that deleted file is gone, but then you download it again or stick it in the same spot, mm -hmm. and then you do another snapshot, is it going to actually have two different copies of the same backed up file? So if I haven't edited the file itself, mm -hmm. uh, say I just restored it or whatever, so the timestamp's going to be different. Mm -hmm. 
and the data blocks where it's written will be different, mm -hmm. but the file itself will be the same. But is it going to have two different copies of it backed up then? Uh, Always. Okay. Because it's copy on write, it's, it's going to have the two copies. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Where's the bulk of development taking place for ZFS? For ZFS? Oh, and that's something I forgot to mention. I actually, I think I missed that slide. That's towards the beginning here, because there's actually something I wanted to mention on that. Uh, yes, I forgot to mention that. So openzfs.org. So this is uh, the foundation for OpenZFS. It's about two years old now. So when um, Oracle bought Sun, the, the original Sun engineers went elsewhere. Um, the ZFS guys uh, never went to Oracle. Uh, again, everything was up in the air. What's going to happen with ZFS? So um, when Sun or Oracle bought Sun, we were at ZFS version 28. And Oracle's now at version 30-something. I haven't really uh, kept up with what they're doing. So OpenZFS was the two original guys who wrote ZFS. And you'll notice in their URL, the name was already taken, so they had to put in a dash. So when you go look it up, it's open-cfs.org. They're continuing development full time, and they've actually created a, both a company and a foundation around it. They're not the only developers, though. So one of the things they did, because they needed to differentiate what is the open source ZFS versus Oracle ZFS. So the next open source version was called version 5000. They really wanted to distance themselves between 30 whatever and 5000. And they switched versioning to something called feature flags. So because there were a lot of open source projects that depended and used on UCFS, so Open Solaris, Illumos, FreeBSD, there's a lot of companies like NetApp uh, that are invested in ZFS, they needed to make sure that development moving forward would be easy, uh, would be portable. So you wouldn't have the next cent of folks doing things that didn't work on Linux and that FreeBSD had to port over. So the whole point of feature flags is that it's usable on any system using ZFS, and it's up to the developers of that operating system to decide which feature flags make sense for their users. So development's moving forward. So one of the things I want to point out about OpenZFS, if you go to their website, it's a wiki. It sucks. They're developers. Um, it's, it's old school. But there's two things that are really interesting there. So one of them is every month online, they have a talk to the ZFS developers, where two hours you can ask questions, any questions you want of them. And that's really cool, and they do that every month. The other thing that's happening is they have uh, a summit in North America once a year. And the next one is the second weekend in November. Uh, whatever that is, and it's in San Jose. So if you actually are um, invested in ZFS or you want to uh, hear it from the horse's mouth, uh, what's happening with ZFS, uh, that summit is available for anybody to attend. And I'll be there because I, I really need to fix our documentation. So I, I want to pick the brains of the people who know the correct answers. So. But uh, it's, so for the longest time it was in limbo, and now it's really exciting because we know things are moving forward. And there is a roadmap of upcoming features, the so new feature flags. And we're very aggressive um, with both PCBSD and uh, FreeNAS. As feature flags are created, we import them in right away. Because especially with FreeNAS, we have a lot of enterprise customers that can benefit from them. Okay. Okay, and I think I've used up all my time. Are we time wise? Okay. Thank you everyone.
customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.